Okay, so I'm Elaine Bignall um, and I'm a non-clinical academic based at the University of Manchester, uh, which is also home to the UK National Aspergillosis Centre and to the Manchester Fungal Infection Group, of which I'm a founding member. And I specialise in the infection biology of this organism, Aspergillus fumigatus, pictured here in its first ever in-print appearance um, in 1870. Um, and even at this point in time, physicians and microbiologists knew that the presence of moulds in the airways of the sick and the dying was evidence that the moulds form a part of the class of parasites which are ready to take possession of our organism whenever it presents a vulnerable point or a point of weak resisting power. And so I suppose within the context of last night's debate, this would amount to reliance upon clinical acumen. Um, because these days, amid a total annual global burden of fatal mycoses, um, which equals that due to TB and malaria, the vast majority of fatalities that we see result from diseases which initiate via inhalation of or respiratory exposure to uh, fungal particles. So it's difficult uh, in an era of ever uh, sophisticated technologies um, to reconcile this burden. Um, and what I'm going to do uh, over the next 20 minutes or so is look at recent progress in the field from a, a pathogen-centric viewpoint. And then after the tea break later on, Frank will give us um, a very nice talk on the host perspective. Um, so what I was going to do uh, was ask you before and after the talk about what you felt um, would and should shape uh, the direction of funded basic research into this disease in the future. Um, and so maybe we can talk about those questions after coffee. Okay, so the point is um, that nature did not design uh, Aspergillus fumigatus spores with human disease in mind, okay, and hence its accolade as an accidental pathogen. And although we focused on the very severe invasive infections at this meeting, these spores are actually responsible for a, a, a much more significant burden of infection, uh, which can be described as chronic, um, and I'll focus on those numbers later on. The spectrum of disease-causing fungi um, is not related in air survey results, uh, and size is certainly a factor, but it doesn't explain uh, the entire story. Uh, the fungi which are most often cultured from human lungs are aspergilli, um, but amongst the pathogenic and non-pathogenic species, spore size is relatively um, equivalent. Although fumigatus does germinate much more quickly than some of the non-pathogenic species, and that process of germination is um, pretty thermotolerant compared with the non-pathogens. So how can we explain this transition from a saprophyte to a pathogen? Well, if we can concede that the initial host pathogen encounter is um, a chance but unavoidable occurrence, then it's the events downstream which shape the outcome of disease. And this involves persistence and ultimately permanence um, of the disease, which is shaped by the pathogen's ability to avoid, evade, or overstimulate the host immune response and this is achieved via the production of an arsenal of secreted proteins and immunotoxins. And this tableau of pathogenicity factors and host factors which influence the outcome of disease has evolved very considerably over the past 10 years. So what have we been up to? Um, this is the story according to PubMed. Um, and this is a yardstick study, uh, simply searching titles for the words aspergillus and fumigatus in the title text. Um, and we've become more productive in terms of literary output. It's doubled. But even at this current peak of activity, you only need to read two papers per week to stay on top of the field. And that's a fifth of the level of activity associated by the same type of search conducted with Candida albicans. These studies can be broken down um, amongst those that have a direct clinical relevance, and I read all 1,500 of the abstracts very quickly uh, to get this information. 
um, focused predominantly on the occurrence, mechanism and monitoring of antifungal drug resistance, um, on case studies, on typing of fungal isolates, and that was influenced by the availability of the genome sequence, um, and also on uh, combination therapies. And anything which occurs below that um, line on the, the column of uh, headings there, we could consider to be niche topics. With respect to um, evidently non-clinical studies, um, so that would exclude the, the blue um, portion of the pie uh, at the top here, um, there appears to be a relatively healthy split between host and pathogen-centric studies, um, and much of what we've learned about the pathogen um, has been assisted by availability of the genome sequence, because this is a, a pretty difficult organism to manipulate at the genetic level. A whole host of transcriptomic studies emerged very shortly uh, after publication of the genome sequence, um, but only one group has thus far managed to publish data derived from the mammalian host environment, um, and this is work from my group. Um, this is a paper that we published in 2008, um, and this was a neutropenic <coughs> mouse study. So a couple of things to point out. First of all, Fumigatus has eight chromosomes, and we're looking at a map of up and down regulated genes expression of which is either favoured or, or not um, in a mouse compared to a standard laboratory culture. So where we see red on this map, we have pockets of upregulated genes. In the middle, running through the centre of each chromosome, we have a plot which expresses the uh, percentage of conserved genes. So these are genes which are present in all of the sequenced Aspergillus genomes pathogenic and non-pathogenic. And what you'll notice about this is that the line is fairly continuous. There are no obvious huge gaps. There are no pathogenicity chromosomes, um, such as we've seen reported in other pathogens. And so we're going to have to look much harder if what we're looking for is a pathogen-specific explanation for predominance during disease. The most deviation sequence-wise is found in the telomeric regions, and that is also where we found the most upregulated genes. Some of them fell into gene clusters. This one, for example, is the gliotoxin biosynthetic cluster, which we know is important in murine and human infection. Uh, and this cluster up on link uh, linkage group three um, is an iron acquisition culture. Um, so we've been working on these pockets of genes, and that work's due to continue for some time. But this was a very static viewpoint of gene expression derived from a single time point. And now we've moved on to make the studies more indicative of what happens during the course of an infection. Um, and so I'm showing you the same type of view. Um, <clears throat> this time, um, sorry, can't quite see the cursor on here. Oh, got it, yeah. Um, this time, over a series um, of different points during the infection, you'll see the bar move across the top of the screen um, from what we would describe as colonization, perhaps in clinical terms, through to invasive disease. And what you'll appreciate is that there's a, an organization, an organized response of the pathogen to the environment during that process of colonization. Um, and the organism, this is a, a, a mouse versus lab comparison, knows the difference between a laboratory culture and what's going on in the host environment. So this is an intelligent pathogen which is tailoring gene expression um, according to its host. Um, so this perhaps could be a feast um, for scrutiny for new biomarkers of disease. And there is information having direct clinical relevance here. So um, Chris Thornton, for example, tells me that the target of his antibody is amongst the genes which are most up expressed in my mouse data set. This is just a couple of examples. Um, the way that these data are represented are as um, columned rankings of transcript abundance. So one of these columns represents every transcript in the fumigator's genome with ones at the top which are amongst the highest expressed and the ones at the bottom, the lowest expressed. And what you can see uh, in different hosts and environments, this is a neutropenic mouse, a corticosteroid treated mouse, a lab culture, is that there are certain genes which are extremely highly prioritized by the pathogen during disease. 
And we've uh, accumulated now a database of over five and a half million data points for these models, and this has generated an extremely robust data set, which can tell us the way in which the pathogen distinguishes between host environments. So this is the gliotoxin biosynthetic gene cluster that I highlighted earlier. And we know that this gene cluster is a virulence factor in corticosteroid treated hosts. This is the corticosteroid model, this is the lab. It's not a virulence factor in neutropenic hosts. So we have a potential um, database here that has very high resolving power in terms of telling us about disease. Um, and this is going to be publicly uh, web interfaced within uh, the next year. Data from human genome sequences um, has also been uh, instrumental in telling us about the basis of disease. Here is a, a table um, which documents most of the published studies. What I would say about these is that most of them are a priori studies, so what we don't have at the moment is any unbiased exome sequencing data from various clinical cohorts, although that work is ongoing at the University of Manchester, and I'm told that amongst that data are markers of uh, risk for infection which are far more robust than what we see in these a priori studies. So that's something to look out for in the near future. Have we seen any landmark translational studies? Um, I would say yes, but these stories take time to develop. Um, this one in particular is a study which was started in 2004 and concerns um, a group of molecules called siderophores, which fungi use to access iron um, in iron-depleted environments. And Fumigatus makes two types of siderophore. One of them is extracellular, triacetyl, fusarin, and C. Uh, and one of them is intracellular and protects the organism from intrinsic oxidative stress. So this siderophore is secreted by the pathogen. It chelates iron, and then it's taken back up again. Um, but we can knock out both types of siderophore if we delete the SIDA gene, and when we do this, we uh, create an organism which is completely unable to secure iron in the host environment and is absolutely attenuated for virulence in a neutropenic host compared to the wild type and a mutant in reductive iron assimilation, which is not siderophore dependent. So these small molecules are absolutely essential for viability in the host, and the fungus will try to reuptake those molecules um, at, at, at any expense. Often this is at the expense of ergosterol biosynthesis because ergosterol biosynthesis and siderophore biosynthesis share a common precursor. So there's an opportunity here for some type of combination therapy. But moreover, because these molecules are so avidly sought by the pathogen, they can be labelled and used as in vivo tracers for foci of infection. So this is a neutropenic rat inhalational model at days one to three. Um, a similar principle to that shown by Chris yesterday, um, but with the important caveat that these molecules not only find the pathogen, they're also taken up by the pathogen. So loading them with potentially toxic um, drugs, for example, um, would be an option here. We're also seeing a massive um, improvement and uh, enhanced sophistication of flow cytometric tools. So we knew um, long before 2004 that the adoptive transfer of T cells could have therapeutic potential, but the technologies were not sophisticated enough to detect T cells against specific antigens which are present in very, very low numbers. This has very recently been achieved via a collaboration um, through a group at the University of Berlin and through Axel Brackhager's group in Jena. This is one of three publications that appeared last year. The point I want to make is that with this enhanced technology, uh, you can seek out aspergillus antigen-specific cells from human subjects with relative ease, and you can categorise those antigens, you can um, expand them in vitro, and you can challenge them with recombinant proteins. And using these types of iterative approaches, it will become possible to phenotype these cells in vitro, work out which ones are the most protective or have the most potential from a diagnostic viewpoint. And this is going to massively expand our ability to manipulate host responses. The other thing I point out, which is quite interesting, is that compared to resting conidia, swollen, germinated, and mycelial extracts <coughs> were much more immunogenic, so it's metabolically active forms of the fungus which appear to be directing that immune response most potently. 
And the other surprise in this data set is that if you look at fractionation of the fungal extracts, actually, above and beyond um, mycelial crude extracts, it's the membrane protein cohort which is stimulating the most response. And that's even greater than what has been seen with the cell wall extracts here. As ever, these types of studies are very dependent upon the nature of the abstract which is used. Candidates for vaccine um, technologies, these are emerging now that we have the ability to look at gene products, knock them out very easily. So this is an exocellular uh, polysaccharide, um, which um, is called galactosaminogalactan, a particular study um, from Don Shepard's lab, which decorates the uh, extracellular surface of hyphae and which is absolutely required for adhesion to the host epithelium and for causing epithelial damage. Um, and the immunogenicity and the utility of these types of gene products um, will be a focus um, for vac vaccinology approaches um, in the next few years. So what does the future hold? In terms of drug discovery, um, a lot of that pilot work uh, will be performed in the academic, not the industrial domain. And we need to deliver targets with mechanisms and preclinical data before they will become attractive um, to uh, the big pharma companies. Um, genetic manipulation of this organism has advanced massively. We're at a stage now where we can envisage having the entire uh, gene knockout collection. Um, this work is ongoing. Mike Bromley at the University of Manchester has a library of transcription factor knockouts now, which is complete, over 400 of those. And we have methodologies for parallel fitness analyses in vitro and in animal models. So we will very soon be able to identify what the major regulatory hubs for the pathogenic phenotype are and what the genes under regulation of those transcription factors are. And this will direct rationale, but also uh, antifungal drug screening in the future. The tools that we use to discover drugs will change, and the rationale upon which those screens is based will also change. So the advances in high-throughput, high-content imaging um, are, we're already beginning to exploit. So this is um, a video which shows the expression of a fluorescently labelled genetic biosensor of calcium concentration in the cytoplasm of fungal germlings. So we're looking at germlings which are um, um, mounting a calcium um, response to stress in a microfluidic chamber where we can study single cells. And calcium modulatory drugs have very potent antifungal activities, but they also modulate um, host immunity. So if we can use tools like this to identify fungus-specific mechanisms, and then also to screen for drugs which specifically target those mechanisms, we'll be in a stronger position. And the same rationale applies to any other type of pathway that we can mark genetically with a fluorescent marker. This is another study um, from the Reed Lab, which shows the uptake of an antifungal peptide, which has been fluorescently labelled. And so what we're looking at here is an Aspergillus fumigatus germling. This is the vacuole. The video will loop. We're seeing the peptide entering into the vacuole of the cell, which then explodes. The peptide is released into the cytoplasm of the cell, and that's a, a fungicidal process. So potential here for cidal antifung uh, antifungal agents, um, but also potential for hijacking the internalization mechanism um, which is involved in getting that peptide into the fungal cell. The way in which we model infection in the future will change. So um, this is an article that recently appeared in Nature magazine, um, written by Arturo Casadevall and Lisan Porofsky. Um, who for a long time have been petitioning um, the microbiological community to ditch the term pathogen. Um, and it's relatively easy to see why um, the involvement of the host is so important when you look at this spectrum of Aspergillus-related disease, which is highly dependent upon host immune status. But the comments I want to pick up on from this very interesting review are that much of the research on infectious diseases continues to be dominated by reductionist approaches, and what is needed is a simultaneous analysis of host and, anti, uh, and microbial variables using new analytical tools. 
These tools will be particularly important for modelling the chronic Aspergillus syndromes, where it's difficult to achieve measurable biomarkers of infection in whole animal models. For the invasive syndromes, we're used to looking at survival studies, um, and these are, again, um, very um, one-dimensional studies which do not, other than the immunosuppression regime adopted, uh, involve any consi consideration or manipulation of host status. But we trust mathematics to train pilots to land aeroplanes, so why can't we trust mathematics to teach us about the way in which infection develops? And this is some work done in collaboration with Ray Tanaka at Imperial College, which describes very simply in mathematical terms fungal burden, cytokine activity, and neutrophil and dendritic cell function. In this type of a model, disease progression looks like this. And a very simple simulation in an immunocompetent host tells us that very low-dose fungal exposure is cleared much more slowly by an immunocompetent host than a high-dose exposure. And these predictions are borne out by experimental um, uh, verification. So to generate this data set with animals would have taken over 1,000 mice. But we can look at these very carefully, choose our time point, and validate quite simply. In terms of capturing both host and pathogen information in whole animal models of disease, I'm showing you um, a video which came from an experiment in the, the Brackhager uh, and Gunzer laboratories. These are GFP-labeled neutrophils chasing calcifloor white-labeled spores in the lung uh, of a, an infected uh, immunocompetent mouse. And so these images were collected minutes after intranasal infection with Aspergillus fumigatus. The mouse was sacrificed, the lung was filled with a very low melting point agarose, and two photon microscopy was used to capture those images. I used them to show medical students why neutropenia is a risk factor for Aspergillus disease. It's really um, very good at engaging their thought process, much better than looking at graphs on a piece of paper. We need to know much more about the respiratory epithelium. We don't know anything really about how the fungus penetrates this. Um, we know that there's an involvement of secreted proteins, and we think that spores can reside inside epithelial cells, potentially providing a latent reservoir of fungus. But these studies haven't really moved on um, since around the year 2005. Um, last year, we published a study um, which showed um, quite conclusively that fungal cells can be internalized by alveolar epithelia. This is a differential staining technique which distinguishes extracellular from intracellular fungal spores, blue uh, and red, respectively. Um, and using these types of approaches, we could show that the process of internalization was damaging for cultured epithelia in vitro. And we found using genetic analyses of mutants, but I only want to focus on the wild type data for this slide, that actually that damage could be um, directed by the composition of the fungal cell wall and almost completely mitigated um, by blocking the recognition of beta-1,3 glucan using an antidectin-1 antibody. Um, so in vitro, at least, potentially curative potential for the targeted blocking of dectin-1-mediated spore recognition, and that's something that we're very interested in following up. So actually, um, if you guys at the back are still up for this, we've got enough time, because I've succeeded on my mission to present the talk in 20 minutes, um, to just look at this question. I was going to ask you, um, based on past activity, um, what we've been doing, what we have the potential to do in the future if you were the head of the MRC uh, and you had limited funds, um, a huge amount of fantastic science that you had to reject every year, and a small budget for antifungal research, where would you place your investment? And I'll read these out before we do the voting. Quantitative holistic understanding of the host pathogen interaction, moderation of azole resistance, immunomodulation, better detection, new antifungal drugs, or an anti-aspergillus vaccine, and you can vote now. So I'll go away and write the next grant application. <laughs> um, and I, th I thank you for your attention. The acknowledgements were embedded in the slide, and um, I've looked at lots of ways to relax after delivering talks at conferences, but this one's going to be a new one, so enjoy.